welcome to the Pettitshire Pan Pals. My name is Antonio. And I am Nathaniel. And we are brothers with each other. We certainly are. How are you doing, it, my brother? I'm great. I'm um, holding up uh, well under these uh, otherwise trying uh, circumstances, trying national circumstances. Indeed. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, actually, uh, no, things have been um, pretty copacetic. How about you? Uh, yeah, no, I've been uh, taking uh, the opportunity indoors to do a lot of uh, nesting, as they say, and uh, uh-huh. kind of building out my, um, you know, little space with the uh, with a little bit of an eye to, well, this time it's all about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for entertaining anyone but me. So what right. would I do <laughs> uh, to keep myself entertained? And the I guess the answer is like buy a whole lot of like home theater equipment and you know deck my whole house out. The American way. I tell you what, you know, I mean, we're you know think locally, act globally, and buy. I guess try to avoid Amazon. I don't know. I mean, it's a that's a tough one, right? We're, well, that we're is talking. kind of thinking locally, though. That's a yeah. That's it. That is one of the odd things about living in the Northwest is that we. <laughs> Starbucks is a local company, Amazon's right. a local Microsoft. company. It's, it's yeah. you know, you got to just look out for a little guy. Yeah, you really should. Yeah. So let's see, today uh, we have something a little special planned. Um, uh, Science Corner. Yeah, Science Corner was one of our uh, popular segments from the original podcast series on brothercast.net. Um, and we figured it might be time to try it out as a live segment mm-hmm. because that was always something that we actually had talked about doing anyway. Oh, and, yeah. Well, and it's, um, my, it's just my favorite thing in the whole world. I just, I, it really, I, yeah. I mean, Dan has a, uh, such an intuitive knack for, um, explaining the physical and uh, theoretical physical worlds. And it really um, has, I really credit Dan with bringing my uh, kind of life into a scientific focus um, oh. prior to kind of your, I mean, it's been a lifelong, I would say, I don't know if obsession is you know the right word to use, but definitely a, a lifelong interest, if nothing else. Um, of yours, right? Even as oh, a Oh, yeah. God, geez. Ever since I was really a little just grade schooler wobbling around on my two legs, I, I wrote in books about wanting to be a scientist and, you know, filled out essays about wanting to be a scientist. And <laughs> I remember, yeah, there was a, one of your um, one of your school kid friends in like elementary school one time and was looking to fact check whether or not you actually had a lab. <laughs> <laughs> like came to me and asked, like, does does he really have a lab, like a science lab? And this is when you were probably in like second grade. <laughs> Depends on how you define science lab. <laughs> yeah, lab if you're um, clever. <laughs> yeah, so you know that um, I, that was always really alien to me. That you know that that um, I don't know that was kind of your track, and my track was you know definitely a different direction from that. And that's sort of right. I don't know like, using this kind of my general. brand that I was not you know, yeah. scientifically minded or, or something. Uh-huh. Um, when in reality, I just never really took the time to find out exactly what it was that you were talking about. And the moment that I took some time to sit with you and have you really, you know, go into depth as to, um, you know, just how the universe ticks, it started to become like, oh, this is really, really interesting. And not only that, but I, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize that I even would have the capacity um, to take on that kind of learning, but it turns out, yeah, and uh, yeah, of you, you know, sure. part of that comes out of your tutelage. Excellent head for reasoning. Um, th- th- <laughs> I think growing up, I'm sort of vaguely aware of the idea that I think a lot of people thought that I was just um, reveling in being a smarty pants or something, but that was never <laughs> the <laughs> right. best. <laughs> about the glory <laughs> no jesus god no no it was literally about how just nakedly entertained i am by the the wonders of reality <laughs> well and what's you know what what turns out uh that it wasn't really articulated very well i think in my you know formal educational years was that it really is a, you know, a, just a, a framework and a code to kind of understand how Absolutely. the world no, fits together. Right. It's, and it's, you know, once you have this foundational, 
Yeah, right. You know, once you once you have a, a concept of what the particles that make up the universe are, then yeah. you know you it starts to make sense why things happen well, the way they do. Even long before you get to that point, there are so many decipherable rules of the you know physical rules of the universe that it's not that it's just like a um, an interesting intellectual bobble to know. It's that it's useful. Right. It's you mastering how the world around you works. Right. So it's like it's like you can, you know, knowledge of leverage will help you get away with a lot more than you could as just a primate. <laughs> well, it's true. You know, I mean, it's when, um, you know, it took a while, I would say, from from going from like, you know, virtually no interest in science to, you know, feeling like I have a pretty good um, fluency now, I think, right. in, in physics. Um, it took a while for me to actually be able to like start synthesizing problems in my own head uh, sure. that I could solve. And, and it, yeah. it just, it was, I would say it was a little bit like a, you know, you know, like a breakthrough, like an epiphany. It just occurred to me all of a sudden that, you know, I remember, you know, really distinctly riding on my bike and thinking about the way that I knew just, just um, practically how the, the energy of my, um, feet on the pedals were affecting the gears and right and had, and had some literal numeric multiplier going on. right and suddenly i got that oh i see you know the the higher the gear the closer to me being directly accessing the axle yes and that, right you know that there's a point where i can basically be one revolution for the pedals one revolution for the tires and then i can then the only limit to how fast i go is how much energy i put into it and that was like um, a, a really unlocked a puzzle about like, well, how do you ever go? Do you need a whole bunch more gears to go faster on a bike? Like what, you know, what is it? Cause I would always run into, uh, with my fixed speed bike, the problem of, you know, not being able to go fast enough where I, right. you know, I get to a, over a, a certain speed and then the, you know, the, sure the, that the there are take up the slack. Yeah. Racing bikes that just have insane gear setups. Yeah. You can you can wind up going 60 miles an hour or whatever. <laughs> well, right. It turns out if you have like three linkages. <laughs> yeah, right, can, right. Yeah, yeah right. You're right. Then you can really crank it down. And mm -hmm. the, the thing, the, the 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 fun thing, and here's a great physics moment, right? Is that you can feel the advantage versus disadvantage. So when you have it up that high, you can feel it like you can feel that each of your pedal strokes is is racing you forward a long way, right? right? But you also know that if you didn't already have the momentum going in that moment, you couldn't move that bike at that leverage. Right. So that's <laughs> that's a good point there. I there is a um, you know, world's fastest bike bike uh -huh. uh, and I think it's, you know, it's clocked in at something like 200 miles per hour or something oh like that. God. And that sounds really impressive, but it's exactly that caveat. In order to get up to that speed, it had to be kind of like dropped at that speed. Yeah, and then it right. could, you know, it, absolutely. It. Just, there wouldn't be enough. You well, here's the thing: you just you you could actually probably do a human powered bike that went 200 miles an hour, with the caveat that you'd have to have a gearing system that was probably the size of a you know teensy tiny Ferris wheel or something. You know what I mean? Like you could you could do it. It wouldn't look like a bike. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, it's, you know, it's just engineering. So, yeah, um, yeah anything is possible, right? <laughs> that you felt like, what is your stock, most dazzling um, science um, topics that you would describe to somebody? Like, what if you were going to just I mean, what have, wow have someone's have some trivia? Something like that. I don't know. Something that, you know, most people wouldn't know or understand or, or have, um, I don't know, some kind of like, you know, easily ability to have a revelation around. Yeah, sure. Well, there's, a, you know, there, so there are a number of physics topics, which I'll happily expand on in a moment. Um, but my favorite just like party trivia to whip out, and you can whip this out too, <laughs> is that plants build themselves from the air. They don't mm -hmm. build from the soil. Right. That a plant's breathing is how a plant gets bigger. It's why soil doesn't go down in a pot, right? All the carbon that builds a giant sequoia tree it breathed in from the air. This is literally made of air. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, carbon from the air. Yeah, I, I've. Uh, that is counterintuitive for some it reason, is. right? That right. That uh, yeah, you think just naturally the way that human eating works, you'd think that they have to scoop up some soil and munch it down and become more tree. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that is that's that's a very good example. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's definitely those kind of questions where the second that you you know you apply yourself and think yeah well, think about it a wee bit I mean, that mm -hmm. is odd yeah <laughs> yeah that's uh i encountered something similar like that with the uh, the tides right like why uh why the tides are affected by the moon and further why the um why the full moon uh, affects the tides more than right um you know other positions within right. the, the celestial well and that and that the, the the real answer is because it's getting a sneaky assist from the sun right right <laughs> Like, well, that's exactly what it is. It's just multiplying yeah. the effect of the well, it's you know. pulling on both sides of the you know. It's the, the at, at those points, you know, the whatever um, midpoint equatorial point between the sun and the moon at those points, the tides must be so low. Oh, absolutely. I think those are the you know that's the one you can just sort of walk out into the mid. Yeah, yeah, right, and right. There are islands you can access by foot that normally you couldn't. Or you just like pick up the Dungeness crabs and just put them right. In. <laughs> just play your piccolo and they'll just sort of rattle into your bag. <laughs> little oysters, little oysters. <laughs> um, okay, well, but, so yeah, but, no, but 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 physics. Yes, physics gets so much crazier and i'm not even talking about the weird you know everybody knows the old trope of like oh quantum mechanics is so crazy so hard to understand and it's true quantum mechanics is great but there's you don't have to get to that level in physics before you have wacky bizarre stuff going on i mean just 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 crazy ass stuff one of my one of my favorite just sort of um existential experiences experiments that you can do at home that's real fun is just take an object any object could be anything let's say this um paintbrush okay okay so here i have a normal everyday painter's brush made of horse hair <laughs> and apparently some sort of virtual hold it hold it vertically in front of you. what's that hold it vertically in front of you so we can yeah. see the real okay. paintbrush it keeps it just keeps being so, like green screen effect on it you take a you take a an object like this and you grip it between your fingers maybe maybe three of your fingers like i am right now or maybe just two whatever you want mm -hmm. whatever. gives you a better sense of w where that object's at and slowly very very slowly as slowly, as slowly as you possibly can reduce the amount of pressure that your fingers are are producing on that object right and of course just as you would expect it starts slowly sliding down, right? And you, eventually you'll drop it. But during that moment, when it first starts to slowly slide and it starts from nothing, you know, it starts from, from an initial motion of zero and you start to loosen that pressure and it starts to accelerate, it's being sucked by a mysterious force mm -hmm. out of your hand, right? I mean, it's literally, what is drawing it out of your hand? I mean, there's an answer to that and that's very complicated, but that's the, the, the very, very fact of gravity, which wasn't thought of as even being a topic of study, you know, for ages and ages and ages, basically until Newton came along, right? That, or I guess Galileo, but, um, but that it's the, it's the strangest goddamn thing in the world to just have this object accelerate away from you. You know, you're not putting any energy into it. In fact, you're letting go of it and it just races away from you. You know, it's incredible, right? Just weird stuff. People don't think about it. I mean, people 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 don't put themselves in that frame of mind. I remember something that you said about being, you know, thinking about, um, you know, the the you know the the ground or the seat being pushed into you just as much as you were. I mean, that's you know, it's you you were pushing out against it as much as it's pushing against you. Right. But you know, the you can think of that as being kind of like. You know, is gravity being like pulled into the <laughs> right that you know into the earth? Well, that right that that you can think of any object as just being a really intense static force <laughs> because it is. That's all it is. That's all matter is. You know, um, and in fact, they're in a really interesting way that will inspire today's science corner. <laughs> um, the Physics of solid objects parallel the, the physics of free space in a way that people might not expect. So 
everybody knows that any given material, if you supply sufficient energy to it through whatever thermal, you know, heating it or just smacking it real hard or whatever, you can get it to spray out photons, right? Well, it turns out that there's an inverted version of that. Uh, an inverted version of that exact same relationship that happens within solid materials. Instead You're going to have to say more, I guess, about spraying out photons. That's, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, just so, so a photon, the, the easiest and perhaps most accurate way to think of a photon is it is the event. It's the smack. It's the, it's the flame coming into contact with the surface. Okay, it's the energy that's being delivered, right? And when a system absorbs that energy, it has to do something with it, right? And oftentimes what that thing that it will do will be, if the photon's at the right wave wavelength, is knock the electrons that are orbiting the nucleus of the atom up into a higher level. But since that's not the natural state of the atom, eventually that electron shell will pop back down and squirt a photon back out with equal energy to the one that excited it in the first place. So in other words, just by hammering a system with energy, so most energy will output in, fo in photon form given the choice, because photons are charge neutral, they're very compatible with the environment, they can pass through right. the environment easily. So it's, not, it's, no big, it's no big deal to emit them. It doesn't take much work to emit Meaning them. Meaning that, so like if you have a surface and a photon hits it, it's more likely to reflect light back off of it than to uh, what? Well, no, 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 it's not, it's, it's simply that regardless of how the energy entered the system, it's likely that it'll exit the system as photons, right? So like, sure. this is how a light bulb works. When, you, when, you, when you're running electron motion through a light bulb, there's resistance. You know, there's, there is, in that, in that little tungsten coil, it can't transfer that electron chain as efficiently as it wants to, and so it gets hot. Right. Okay. Because the energy is still coming in, and it's not being able to vent it through motion of electrons in the way that it would like to. And so the way that it the way that it winds up trying to equalize that energy is just pouring photons out into the universe, right? Dropping all those electron shells down a level, hopefully. But then they're just continually getting re-energized by the input of brand new electrons into the system by the wall current. Right. And so, um, like I say, any any system really, if you energize it enough, will start spraying out photons and. And that was a real fundamental discovery in physics because it made us realize that if every single material has its own point at which it'll spray out photons, um, then you can tell what material something's made of mm -hmm. by seeing what color of photons it's spraying out when you superheat it, right? So it turns out that when you look at a star, based on its spectrum, you can tell what it's made of. You can tell if it has iron in it, you can tell if it has oxygen in it, whatever, because different materials heated to intense degrees will output different frequencies of light in, in an effort to try and cool down. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, one kind of fascinating side of sidebar, I think that, that, that kind of this reminds me of is, you know, things that are translucent or transparent are actually just just not excited by the photon. Yes, right? right, exactly. It's just that the photons are passing through them. They just yeah. pass through it. And so rather yeah. than like reflecting off some kind of shape, it's just sort of like kind of the shape light pat looks like. When right, and okay. and people people have a hard time with that. People have a, a hard time with the notion of like glass has the solid stuff and it doesn't, you know, whatever. But uh, um, it's not, it's, it's, more, it's more familiar than people might think. So mm -hmm. it, it seems real strange in an atmosphere thinking, oh, well, if that thing had the right index of refraction, it would just be invisible right now, even though it's a solid object. That sounds real strange, but think about this. If you take a drinking glass, which admittedly is already made of clear glass, but whatever, and you put it under water, mm -hmm. water and glass have almost, almost the exact same index of refraction. And so right. the glass disappears. In fact, you yeah. can have air materials that have the same index of refraction as water within human perception range anyway. And when you, when you put your, you know, you hold them in your hand, you put it under water, you couldn't tell that you're holding an object except that you're feeling it. And, you know, so the, 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 the same is true of, of being in the open atmosphere. It's no, it's no different. It just requires slightly different chemistry than the underwater version. It just takes something matching the refractive index of the atmosphere. But like there are versions of aerogels that are more or less invisible, right? Completely heat proof, really strong, but 
you wouldn't know if you were going to run into a wall of it. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly airs. Yeah, you wanted to explain yeah. aerogel gels a little bit? Oh, uh, okay. So we're all familiar with the concept of an aerosol, which is a material typically in a can with a solvent in there, aerosol. And what happens is that solvent dissolves the material, whatever the chemical is, it's usually another liquid, but it can be a solid as well. It causes that to expand. It changes the, it changes the, uh, um, you know, the pressure front of that material and causes it to accelerate, causes it to expand. Well, an aerogel is the exact opposite. An aerogel is when you take a material and you apply chemistry to it such that all that's left is a solidified cloud. You know, it, it, it's like spraying a cloud into the air in reverse, okay? So you're taking what a solid material and you're extracting stuff from it until it's a cloud, <laughs> right? That's how an aerogel works. It's gelling together. Right. Yeah, and it, uh, like it is basically air that has, a t you know, huge amounts of little canals and spaces and things like that that are formed when you, as, as far as I know, when you, you, you have to do it in a low pressure environment and actually suck yeah, out yeah. a material that took the right. place of the, you know, whatever is, you know, being left behind in the aerogel, yes. um, which is cool. <laughs> we have a actual caller. Uh, we oh, have a good. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to start tuning it in. Ladies and gentlemen, our first, first time caller, ladies and gentlemen, Camber Hall. Ah. Hi, Camber. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. We're just about to kick off Science Corner. Yeah. Uh, we've been just completed a conversation about aerogels. Uh, are you familiar with the concept of aerogel? Yes, those are awesome. Oh, they yes. are awesome. outer stretches of space and time. No question can defy explanation in the science The topic that we have queued up today is antimass. And specifically, we're dealing with the concept of phonons. Are you familiar with phonons, sir? No. So phonons are, just as they kind of sound, are the kinetic equivalent of photons. They are the transmissory node quasi-particle of kinetic energy. And so what you, uh, you w w when you get photons is whenever you have a, a rigid material, material with a crystal lattice, and you smack it mm -hmm. in just the right way, the transverse wave that's created creates a probability cloud of nodes within that material. And the net result is that there's a, a void in the material, right? There's a little, a little hole in the material yep. that's traveling through the, through the material. Um, and <laughs> because of this, the more phonons that you add to a material, the lighter weight it is. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, so, so phonons are a form of antimass. And, and the way that you can tell this is that phonons are like a Chinese checkerboard where all of the spaces are filled in with marbles, okay? Mm -hmm. And you remove one marble, okay? Well, now you have a hole in your collection of marbles and you can move the other marbles around all you want, but you'll never be able to destroy that hole using the number of marbles that are available, mm -hmm. right? In other words, without adding something to that material, that hole is just as real as any of those marbles. And it turns mm -hmm. out that that's really true, that photons and phonons are almost completely indistinguishable in terms of the uh, field dynamics that describe them, right? Uh, so for example, phonons, even though it's counterintuitive, are non-local. You cannot pinpoint the exact physical location of a phonon. All you can do is say that there are this number of over overlapping harmonics mm -hmm. within that material. Yeah, right. So it's yeah. somewhere in there, but it's just like the probability cloud <laughs> of a of a non-mass electromagnetic particle. Mm -hmm. You know. So in that Chinese checker metaphor, then yeah. how you know you? It seems like you would be able to describe it there. Is that just an oversimplification, or is that? Um, 
No, that is an, an oversimplification. In the Chinese checkered model, that missing marble would represent a probability field. Or the sum total of mass, perhaps, right? Well, this, this, it, would be, it would be the sum total of, um, it would be the sum total of uh, Schrodinger wave functions, the total over. I mean, not, that's not going to mean anything to anybody. The, 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 um, the important thing to, the, the reason the Chinese checker model is so fun is because it teaches you a lot about the way, the exotic way that anti-mass behaves. So anti-mass as opposed to anti-matter. So anti-matter has an, an inverted charge, right? Mm -hmm. So a positive particle, negative particle come together, they'll cancel out if they have exactly the same energy. Yep. Well, for phonons, it's the exact same way, but since the medium of expression is kinetic interaction, if you push on a phonon, it travels in the opposite direction, right? It's anti-mass. And again, that sounds counterintuitive until you realize on that Chinese checkerboard, if you move one of those marbles, the hole is now moved into your finger, mm -hmm. right? In other words, it's traveled against the direction that you've pushed it. And that didn't destroy the hole unless you leave your finger there, in which case you've become integrated into that system. <laughs> the only way you can remove yourself from that system is by recreating the phonon, right? So phonons, just like normal, you know, even though it's a quasi-particle, it's just as inviolable as a natural particle, as a normal particle. So what what would cause something to spew um, phonons? Phonons, yes. A like lot the of light would, kinetic you know, impact. Light would emanate Actually, from. Um, one of the one of the interesting things about phonons is that they. I'll tell you a parallel to photons about this in just a moment, but just in the same way that photons are an attempt to maintain a minimum, a, a ground state, a ground energy state for the whole system. Mm -hmm. A phonon is the equivalent in kinetics. So the, the, any energy that's introduced into the system that can't be expressed via say an orbital change, which would lead to a photon, you know, and, and it is purely kinetic, is purely, you know, sonic, I guess in this case. I, I had a, a, some speculation as to whether or not I was developing adult allergies. Um, uh, because, you know, I mean, it's a, a questionable time to be sick, but I was sick for m many weeks with non COVID like symptoms. And those were like snippiness and strippiness. And, um, but it turns out that pollen is, uh, is like a huge problem these days because there's so much of it. And that's all because they really strategically started planting all male plants all over the country. <laughs> What? <laughs> so that they wouldn't, um, they yeah, wouldn't actually um, reproduce with each other. Um, and so the result is great, no reproduction, but lots of pollen. Uh, lots of cross-pollinization. You'd think that that would lead to a lot of weird transgenics in regions that wouldn't normally have them. Well, it just leads to like bright yellow streets across yeah. the West. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the whole thing could have been avoided if they just planted all female plants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, of course. <laughs> Never would have gone into. <laughs> Plus, you could induce them to make fruit. I don't, yeah, it's. <laughs> well, the problem is some of them are stinky, or there's like different reasons yeah, that you yeah. don't want them to. They, you know, you don't want them to be able to get fertilized, but um, yeah, right. still, they won't get fertilized if there's no male plants. <laughs> yeah, but it only takes one or two of us to ruin things. So, yep. oh well, <laughs> that's, right. that's why we have murder hornets right now. Yes. Somebody brought over a murder hornet. <laughs> So it's better to have uh, gametes flowing all over the place and breathing them as opposed to poor little babies. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. Stinky no. and slimy. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Now deal with them when they're fragmentary. <laughs> all those fish-based methods are slime and ooze. <laughs> One of the things I want to study more of is lateral gene transfer. Oh, yeah. That's bizarre. We have a good amount of that going on, and I don't think we've really studied how much of it is. You know, we have, we're just getting into where we're able to sequence genomes fairly cheaply. Right. So we're starting to identify some of that. I hear so what is that? Tell, tell us what that uh, that looks like. The easiest thing to start with is a virus. So a virus inserts its DNA or RNA into us, and several of them, um, like the virus that causes warts, 
actually integrates the DNA into our cells and it's there forever. Um, One of the really cool ones is actually with little wasps. They have a a virus that can cause uh, immunodeficiency. So basically defeat your immune system and they only produce it. They actually control this. They only produce it when they want to put their eggs inside the host. Hmm. So there's several different hosts. Virus? Yeah. So they actually produce a virus to deliver with their eggs. Wow. That is cool. That's the kind of trivia I was looking for. (laughs) That's crazy. Well, I love how that's basically just like clockwork. It's just like. Yeah, right, right. It's like all these little mechanisms. Yeah. Completely (laughs) unintelligent and I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, you know, that's that's a really cool instance because it's because the wasp can control it. But, you know, like with us, with warts and things like that, it's just like when we're stressed and our immune system seems to be decre- you know, decreased slightly or whatever, right. it'll start to come out. And, resources elsewhere or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's other genes that have somehow gotten into, you know, other organisms and stuff, too. You know, mm-hmm. they've crossed the barrier between a cell and somehow gets in there um, to stay generation to generation. Of course, it has to be in the germ plasma, but... Right. That's There's uh, poor Tasmanian devils apparently um, are <laughs> suffering from communicable cancer in their noses and mu- their muzzles because they they fight with each other and they actually are able to. Uh, okay. Okay. This is brother. Spread the vaccine. Question that why would that why would because we we've probably all heard those tales about the Tasmanian devils fighting. Right. <laughs> The question is, why is this arising during modern history? Why isn't that just a, why wasn't that always just a fact of Tasmanian devil life? Why the hell would they have a a transmissible version of cancer that sprung into being now? They have a very short life cycle. They only have to be about five. So everything that happens to them happens quickly. So they can, you know, they can mutate quickly too. But I mean, a lot of cancers are caused by viruses. Sure. No. Yeah, that's true. I, I hadn't thought about that, that maybe it's not the cells being passed that matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you know, it could be yeah, coincidence. Yeah. It could be stress on the environment where when the environment was a little bit, you know, more like it was 100 years ago, they could actually fight it off a little bit better. Right. Sure. No, that makes sense. I, I, in fact, from what I understand, that's uh, uh, maybe even the majority driver of any extinction in any era is just that the environmental changes they don't even have to be drastic they just have to be enough that some local organisms system has to be dedicating some time to dealing with that and thus can't deal full time with whatever the attack on its body was yeah yeah exactly you know and for for evolutionary forces the percentage advantage of one thing or the other can be very very small like oh, one yeah. or two percent is huge <laughs> right written written over billions of iterations sure yeah. Not even that many, you know, if you do them, you know, some of the math, you know, within a hundred generations, just a one or 2% advantage of one, you know, uh, gene, you know, phenotype can it's, take it's, over. It's like de- decisive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. No, I'm, I'm sure that's true. You can see that in, you can see that just in like, um, fundamental logic games mm-hmm. where like once some little nugget is introduced, it's just sort of a poison pill and that's, it's going to dominate this logic structure from that point forward. Yeah. You know, I mean, we see that with coronavirus. Of course. One yeah. maintains right. it and 1.1 1. 1 increases it. Right. Yes. At first, barely right. noticeably. <laughs> right. Right. That's right. And that it's, and, and people just don't deal with math well enough to realize that like, that sounds like this fractional percentage, but compounded, it's, it means eventually every, literally everyone on earth gets the virus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, the fast parts of our brain that are responsible for, charting courses by looking at you know like how fast something's going how do i outrun that predator or whatever it's It's all linear yeah Yeah, well it's all linear yeah right right. we're really bad at at thinking of anything non-linear right 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 sort of nebulously quantified things yeah you know one of my favorite thing is you know futurist projections you know Uh, go back in sci-fi and stuff you have lots of projections about when things are going to be and in the near term we always are over overly optimistic yes like right. they don't happen in 20 years or 40 years right. but in the long term we actually aren't you know aggressive enough we actually underestimate what's right. available right there's a difference between the sort of common understanding of what it would take to accomplish a given thing you know old old sci-fi from the like 
you know, in like 30s, would have like robots with natural speech, but they wouldn't have figured out that the that would imply that they'd have these super advanced computers because otherwise you couldn't have a robot that advanced, right? right. It's like there's this cascade of available abstractions mm -hmm. that come anytime there's some new concept, you know? We only have the tools today that we, we have today. Right. And then we develop a new tool. And then it's going to take a little while, but that new tool is used to create the next tool. Right. So right. if we want to think linearly, well, we're going to be undershooting it in the short term. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Then, and then it's going to exceed it on the long right. term. Right. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, every area of knowledge that I've, you know, that I've looked at and other people, you know, far more intelligent and focused on this than I have, knowledge is exponential. Sure. Yeah. Even, right, even, right. Like, yeah. like, like within a, within a society. Yeah. Right. That. Well, even in organisms, yeah, even in organisms, because once you have a, you know, a set of DNA that produces a certain thing, wow. well, now you can produce that and you can use it for different things. I mean, the reuse of DNA is all over the place and then right. slight modification for eye color versus, you know, carrying oxygen or something. Mm -hmm. Totally sure. not a real example, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but. But no, I know, I know exactly what you mean, that, that there, there are handy little things that we can snip out of things that we've encountered in the past that are that are very useful in future you know even if it's not even related like oh well we use this gene that they would have used to you know whatever time some the development of some internal organ or something and instead we use it to digest milk or so you know yeah. <laughs> all kinds of examples <laughs> like that. Yeah. sometimes you get like venom and stuff out of that though so it's you know oh yeah oh sure. cool yeah yeah you know all our favorite plants have uh you know alkaloids and stuff oh yeah so. Well, and that's what they, they, they say that most venoms arose out of um, having big clumps of mixed pollen structures, which are huge molecule, you know, tend to be really large structures, tangled together, and that there's some structure that the arthropod wanted that is part of its diet, and then there's all this other tangle that was just garbage, with the exception of things like scorpion venom and things, that most yeah. of the venoms are derived from the compounds that the creature takes in, rather mm -hmm. than being synthesized in their bodies? Yeah, a good number of them, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, there's those nudibranchs. <laughs> yeah. That eat jellyfish, men of war, that kind of stuff, and then right. they'll put, right. and just don't care. Move their, move their, well, they move the stinging cells, you know, to, to the, their skin. They actually keep right. them alive and put them, them That's right. Yeah. yeah. Some of them have very elaborate, like, decorations on their back with special uh pathways from their stomach that go up into their back just yeah. for that very purpose to transfer <laughs> no, is, oh really yeah you know, like, you, can, you know the stomach looks like some place. kind of weird t upturned udder or something that <laughs> <laughs> transmits the blastocyst yes <laughs> It's a valuable weapon. Why would you throw it away? Yeah, right. <laughs> Yoink. I'll take those. <laughs> I know. What can you imagine? Can you imagine what a what a, a raw deal that is for the anemone? It's just like, come on. <laughs> I'm really of those. Hey, <laughs> guys, off me. It's just like like uh, like plants that produce like capsaicin or whatever. They look. Like. You want that? You're okay. eating more now. <laughs> Willingly eating pesticides, aren't we? Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. We have fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun game for us. <laughs> well, um, my friends and brothers and uh, lovers, we have reached the end of another episode. Oh my, oh my God! Is that Jesus? That's true. <laughs> Time flies. Wow. Well, yeah. Any, yeah, any closing thoughts? We'll start with our guest, Camber. Anything you'd Camber. like to the world well, to know? Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. One of the things is that we've got the COVID challenge right now. Mm -hmm. And what's exciting about that, though, is that we are discovering new social structures, new yeah. ways of doing things. Yeah. And some of those, even if life were to return to exactly like it was six months ago, are advantageous and we're going to be using those. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Knock the inertia out, which is, you know, one of the things that's going on. And it's sad that it costs what it does, but. Right. So that's what I'm dealing with right now is like, what are, what are the new social structures that are coming out and how can we actually leave this, you know, richer as a, as a culture and society? I like to think that there might be a generation of nerdy young kids who grow up 
just thinking it would be the coolest thing in the world to be a virologist. Because when they were a kid, the virologists were these like scientist heroes. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that we maybe know about 5% of the viruses out there. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, how much how much of our daily experience is actually influenced by that? And we're just not it's just not sig significant enough to get yeah. our attention. Yeah. yeah, you know, and so there's going to be another one of these that comes along. Mm -hmm. So getting to build up our tools, investing in this as a, you know, as a cult, you know, as a, a society, it's going to be critical. We'll learn some really good lessons about how to do it and, and the, the do's and don'ts, hits and misses yeah. of the pandemic uh, from this time around. <laughs> And then maybe and then we dress rehearsal, hopefully. For the real one. <laughs> well, on one aspect, I, I see why, you know, like some people, oh, it's just like the flu. Well, because you watch all these movies and nobody's turning into zombies or anything. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's not, yeah, blood isn't coming out of eyes. It's not that. <laughs> They're just dying. Is all. Don't. <laughs> you really have any ideas. A virus that spreads because it squirts out my eyes. <laughs> right. Right. No, that's, that's, that's what people don't want to hear. But viruses, things like viruses just don't need to get that creative. They're no. just Oh, how long is it going to be till we have like cordyceps that are reprogramming us? We're, you know. Oh, I mean, we're you due know, for something to better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Couldn't come at a better time. <laughs> right, we we're pausing the carbon emissions on the planet just for a second, and yeah. Oh yeah. God, I'm so excited about after the spring growth that with the reduction in pollution that's come with the reduction in human activity. There will also be this, you know, growing season of all the different plants and that come like late summer, the air is just going to be crisp. Well, until that time, <laughs> <laughs> we're wishing you the best of the week. And a safe return to us next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Thank folks. you. <laughs> Bye.